937, hard for his number one for hip hop and R&B. This is the beat of CT. I'm Jenny Boom Boom, your host, my co-host DJ Michi's here. Hi, Michi. Hey, Michi. another Sunday. Yes, sir. And of course, today, I'm really excited about it. We have Bo Doherty, who is the president of Special Olympics Connecticut here, mm -hmm. and Nicholas Feligno, who is a committee member and volunteer for Special Olympics of CT. Welcome. How are you? How's Great. It going? Thanks for having Great. me. Great to be here. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm very ex interested in everything you guys have going on with Special Olympics CT. And, Bo, I'm going to start with you today. Uh, you have gone from a robust program with numerous events in this pandemic, and how have you adjusted, you know, with everything that's happening with this pandemic? Well, it's been pretty interesting because I'm, I'm one of the veterans of the organization now, so it's always been. Uh, and I, So I started full-time in 82 in Massachusetts. All we do is run events. So you go from event to event to event. We have big, monstrous games. We have four of them in Connecticut. We have all the qualifiers that go to those. You have all the fundraising events. You do all the high school unified tournaments and middle school tournaments. Um, and you go from that to all of a sudden, here come the breaks. Right. And all of us in Special Olympics around the world, there's 180 countries, uh, 52 U.S. programs that are pretty strong. We all got an edict from the international office pretty much saying that you cannot do in-person competitions or training of athletes or fundraising of any particular effort with groups of people till June 30th. Mm. So when you go from going from event to event, night times, weekends to, your, you, you know, what is, what are you going to do? Uh, it's very interesting, uh, especially when you've done it a, a number of years. So here's, here's the good news. So the good news is that because we are global and, uh, you know, we communicate with friends from uh, other states and countries, Italy and Minnesota um, has started to do some virtual games. So we started to go down the route of doing virtual summer games. And we, we have a full court press going on with a ton of athletes. We're signing up for uh, events within cycling, soccer, tennis, and track and field where what they do is they choose an activity, um, they send in the video of it and what they uh, got in terms of the score. And then on that particular weekend, we'll be uh, delivering them um, a bunch of praise online. We have a big radio dance uh, party uh, on Friday night, we have an opening ceremonies where people from WWE and other friends of ours have all gotten on and uh, so that we do an opening ceremony. So we're, we're changing what was physical to virtual right now. Nice. And quite frankly, I think we're going to go that way for a while. The last thing I do want to say, um, two things, and we can get into the details more if you want to. We have a Fit Five program. We are one of the states that actually has a fitness director, and we've been doing fitness for a long time. So we have about 600 athletes that have signed up on this uh, private page because I don't want anybody to be able to get in there um, if we don't know they're legitimate. And uh, they've been doing yoga, uh, running, walking, nature hikes, eating properly. We have... Uh, Specialists that come in there all the time talking doing yoga teaching people mindfulness sports psychologists so that has become big and and the, the struggle for us is that you have we have 12,000 athletes in this wow. state so you go from 12,000 people who've been doing all these different things now they don't always all do summer games they don't all do winter games, but a lot of them do, um, you know, summer and winter games. So you go from that to they're in a home, they're with their parents, they're in a residential program somewhere with staff, hold up. I talked to the, the CEO of Favar, a friend of mine, Steve Morris, today, and they have not loosened up anything till, till this week. For like three months, none of their people could work. All his staff have been working overtime. People can't really get out of their apartments really in a big way. They're all in these homes. So what are they doing? Right. They're sitting on the couch and the obesity rate of our athletes in Connecticut alone 
and we do a lot of screening all the time, is 49%. Wow. So you start looking at diabetes, you start looking at all that other stuff. So in our athletes, it's social, as Nick had said. So you've got all these people sitting at home, sitting in their apartments. Are they really moving? What are they doing for activity? Right. And socially, what are they doing? Right. When they're used to going to Special Olympics and going to the dance and seeing their friends, and that's the, one of the greatest things that we do. Everybody talks about the sports side. When we do a dance and you've got 2,500 athletes, they're all dancing. Right. You know, the, 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 our athletes, the, the inhibitions are not there. You know, they're, they're dancing and, they're, and you have athletes from Greenwich, you have athletes from Plainfield, you have athletes from Mystic, you have athletes from Norwich, you have athletes from um, Torrington. So you've got all these different people seeing each other and that is kind of come to a halt. What I will tell you is that we have 71 head coaches in the state all spread out throughout this, the entire state. And we have purchased them Zoom. Mm. So okay. They can stay in touch with the athletes. One of our, one of our programs down in the um, New London area in Groton, she does bingo events every other week, you know, with all the athletes, just to keep them socially involved. So we've had to change. And we're going to continue to change until – we see light at the, at the end of the tunnel. In the fall, we might end up doing some in-person sports, but maybe small numbers, mm -hmm. maybe more tournaments around the state. And we're going to have to keep a virtual element to this thing because I don't see this going away for a while. Yeah. Right. It's pretty scary. They're talking about, what, a second wave in the fall. So everybody's kind of proceeding with caution with every event, you know, planned right now. Um, can I ask you a quick question, Bo? You said you got involved in the 80s with Special Olympics Connecticut? Yeah, no. So, so in 76, I went to my first games in uh, Tufts University for Massachusetts Special Olympics. Uh, and then 79, the commissioner of the Department of Developmental Services had a deal for me to work twice a week for Special Olympics in 1982 in Massachusetts. I worked full time for them as the program director and came here in 86. Okay. So that's kind of, you know, but you know, when you're in Special Olympics, I'll be blunt, it is a family. So we're not like these independent little groups that, you know, geographically, you know, we have our own cultures and whatever, but we are, we know a lot of people across borders, which is a really good thing. And so it never feels, for me, I define my work in Special Olympics as both in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Mm. Mm. What, like, where did you find that passion originally to get involved with it? Um, completely in, off, it, 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 it was one of these shocking things that sometimes you hear about with college kids. Uh, as Nick will laugh hearing this, you know, my degree is in wildlife management. So I went to college, a specialized college where all my friends were game wardens and they were forest rangers and forestry guys. And uh, as a junior, this big institution in Massachusetts came after me and said, we will give you a ton of money to run a program, not for me personally, but to run an outdoor recreation program. It was the first in the state of Massachusetts for people with intellectual disabilities. And I went and I, I got out of my car to this interview and I had, was surrounded by a hundred people we're all hugging me <laughs> and, and then I go in for the interview and they're all hovering around the, you know, uh, the doorway. And as I come out, they're all hugging me and, and it, that kind of really changed me. So I actually told um, people in a job up in Maine that I wasn't coming and I completely shifted gears and ended up uh, working for people with disabilities on my mm. life. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. And, and another question really quick. How long has Special Olympics been in existence? So 68 was the first year in Chicago. I went uh, two years ago. We had the 50th anniversary and I went back. I went to Chicago I was with all the founders. Um, and, you know, of course, Eunice you know, Kennedy Shriver, who started Special Olympics, is not with us anymore. But I was with a lot of the people that started things and uh, and it was unbelievable. They actually have a torch at Chicago at the Soldier's Field, this monstrous torch now that is lit all the time um, in honor of Special Olympics, which is, you know, 
if you look around the world, this is going to sound crazy to you until this scenario that we're in right now. There are 4 million people in Special Olympics. Wow. 4 million. You know what? I never, until you guys came on the show today, I did not realize how big Special Olympics is. Right. And, you know, and I was, you know, at points in time, I'm like, yeah, that can't be. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I meet the head of China, <laughs> you know, or I meet the CEO of India. And, and you know, I, I'm privy because I've been around long enough to see numbers. And you go to World Games and uh, it's, a, it's a pretty incredible program. I mean, I remember watching, you know, being, you know, having ancestry from Ireland. You know, I, Ireland in the World Games never walked in as Northern Ireland in the Republic of Ireland. They walked in as Ireland mm-hmm. for as long as I can remember. And, and, you know, I remember um, at the award stand at uh, the games in Minnesota where uh, the Queen of Jordan and the Prime Minister of Israel together are awarding medals and giving hugs and kisses to not only the athletes, but to each other. <laughs> it's like, you know, this stuff, it's, it's funny because, you know, when people do good things, it, it really changes you. Uh, and you get caught up in that, you know, Nick will tell you that, you know, one of the great things about our events is not only the athletes who come up and, uh, you know, it's so funny and great, uh, volunteers that show up, they're unbelievable. So you have this huge group of people who are giving up their time, usually good hearted human beings with athletes. And when you go, when you're immersed into that, it's a pretty good feeling to come out of it. Well, you know, speaking of that, Nick, how many years have you been volunteering with Special Olympics CT? I think it's been about 28, 29. I wow. Somewhere wow. around 90, 91. It's um, when they roped me in. Uh, a coworker of mine was getting transferred somewhere uh, in another part of the company working for Northeast Utilities at the time, which is now Eversource. And he asked me to get involved and help get equipment and supplies for some skiing thing the company did. Uh, neither one of us knew much about it. So I got involved with that and went and got on the committee helping get stuff for the uh, cross country event at the time. Wow. And that's when the kind of the bug bit me. Um, and I started with that, did that for several years, uh, helped with equipment and supplies. And then I worked my way up and I was venue director for, I think only a year or two. And then I was getting kind of tired of being out in the cold. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Around about that time, the same coworker came back and we were working together and we came up with the idea to start a golf tournament to raise money to offset the snowmaking costs mm-hmm. for the summer, for the winter games, because uh, we're the only place, as far as I know, still in the world, both, correct me if I'm wrong, that actually makes snow for a Special Olympics event. Oh, absolutely, for cross-country skiing, yeah. For cross-country yeah, skiing. We are it. We, no one does that. Wow. No one in the world that does it. We have a team of volunteers that... Go out in a field and make snow for two months so there's enough to actually hold the events. Wow. <laughs> in Connecticut. So we started this golf tournament to offset the cost of snowmaking. Well, that first year we raised $20,000. Jeez. And then it's, it grew and grew. And then um, Bo actually, I think, introduced us to the Mashantucket Pequot tribal members who did a, who did a event, golf event at, in Rhode Island, a golf course they had there. And they said, hey, we're building Lake of Isles golf course at, at Foxwoods, what do you say we join forces? So we did that. And fast forward now, four or five years now, we're together with them. Now we're selling out two golf courses. Wow. And now we're raising fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. Wow. And then Bo calls me. I'll never forget this. As long as I live, I was standing in Tim Hortons on my way to Rhode Island, to Newport, having a coffee when Bo called me and said, hey, I just left a meeting with Susan St. James. And I was, wow. And I was telling her about your event, and she loves to play poker. What do you think? Is there a way we could fit, you know, fit it in? And that was the first year we came up with this. On Monday was my golf tournament. So we came up with a Susan St. James Texas Holden Poker Tournament on Sunday at Foxwoods. Wow. And now we're selling overnight packages. We've got corporations flying people in for this event. And it's grown into one of the largest golf events that they have at Foxwoods. This will be our 19th year, I think, coming up if we have it this September. And last year was great. We raised one hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars for Special Olympics. Wow, that's wow. so incredible! That's amazing. Between the two that's of awesome. them, so it's just one of these little things that got legs and grew. That's and crazy. one of the great things that he does is, you know, uh, Nick and the committee will get together and go, and we want to restrict a little bit of this money. All of it's unrestricted except a little, and they send athletes to World Games. 
Oh, wow. wow. That's yeah, amazing. We, we sponsored the, the athletes. That we, I think we sponsored the athletes that went to uh, Korea. Mm. Yep. Sponsored athletes that went to other countries and even the national games at times from some of the money that we make. We sent some people to Seattle to the USA games. And next time around, I can't tell you where the next World Games are. It's top secret, but actually no. Oh, well, Bo, I mean, you know royalty and you know all the big stars, so you can right. tell us this too, you know? <laughs> if I let the word out, I'll get killed and they'll, they'll break it back to me. But at any rate, um, you know, Nick will be sending two, I think two athletes to those games. Yeah. Nice. Oh, that's so exciting. You know, um, you know, Jenny, I've been to uh, the Special Olympics twice. Oh, I didn't know that. Where? Um, in Connecticut. Uh, and when I was in high school, the the band director actually sent a couple of us up to play like during the the games so i was able to like you know check it out and see just how amazing the program is and like i, I still remember that till this day wow. and um it, it was just beautiful man it was it was crazy was that a southern what instrument dj yeah uh so at the time I, I played like a lot of different instruments but i think uh i was either playing drums or um or clarinet at the time how many years ago uh, sh- I've been out of high school for like, <laughs> like uh, two years, 11, 12, 13 yeah. years now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's been I, a minute. The reason I ask is that I'm the entertainment coordinator for summer games. I took okay. that up probably about 10 years ago. Oh, so, you, so that you, remember, could, you just uh, miss Michi, uh, Nick. You just miss Michi. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Lund. I'm, I'm not yeah. sure if you remember Mr. Lund or. Yeah. No, no, that was before my time, I think. Okay. Well, I still DJs if you ever need a DJ yeah, for anything. I'm, I'm you know? definitely down for the dance parties. <laughs> uh, I got your name. You're not getting away now. <laughs> so that feeling that you had, Nick, being a part of, you know, this even first experience and how everything has grown, is that what motivates you to keep going? Well, actually. The Special Olympics CT? Oh, definitely. Getting to know the athletes. And you know what? Once you get to know the staff and everybody at Special Olympics, it's like you just want to hang out with them and you want to do more. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, you want to help in any way you can. Um, but I really think my passion started, and this is something that I, I had won an award at Special Olympics and did a video. And what I really stressed was, I think it's about planting a seed. And I think without me realizing it, my father planted a seed in me when I was a little boy. My father was a hairdresser. And uh, he, I, a lot of times I'd go to the shop to get my haircut and there would be a, a person with intellectual disabilities there that my father befriended. He cut their hair for free, or we'd go out to the diner in the morning to have breakfast if I was going to work with him that day, and there'd be a special needs uh, person washing dishes would come out and talk to my father. And I was a little kid, and this, had, you know, I think really made an impression on me that I didn't realize right. until years later, here I'm getting involved with Special Olympics, and, you know, there it is, you know? So I think that had a lot to do with it as well. But really, the, when you go to the games, there's a lot to learn. You, you don't realize what you don't know until you go there, uh, one of my first impressions was that the first year I was doing um, cross-country skiing. I'll never forget Big Mike. Um, I watched him skiing, and he fell down. And everybody just kept yelling, come on, Mike, go, Mike. And the poor guy's crawling. And I'm like, come on, somebody go help the guy. What are they all standing around for? Now, after like four minutes, Mike crawls across the finish line. They help him stand up. He throws his arms in the air and goes, yes. Yeah. And that's a hit me. It's about crossing the finish line. It doesn't right. matter how you do it. And that's when I got it. I said, okay, it's not about winning or losing. It's about being able to compete and just finish. That's such a, that's such a beautiful story. Yeah. I, I still see Mike to this day. It's a, he doesn't do winter games anymore. He does summer games. He remembers me. I'll say, hey, Mike. And he, hey, Nick, how's it going? So, and he's probably in his 50s now, I would think. Wow. But, uh, you know, those are the things that happen that make you just want to go back every year. Uh, the other thing that's come out of it is my daughter, who's now 38, when she was a little girl, always came to the games with me. Hmm. And now she's got her master's degree in special ed. Wow. So she's also involved in that now. And my wife is a para for special needs kids in uh, Plainville High School. Wow. So we've kind of, our whole family's kind of been involved in uh, with people with intellectual disabilities all around. So it's, it's rewarding and fun. Yeah, you must feel so much satisfaction satisfaction being involved with special olympics ct oh yeah you do especially this year's tough with the virtual games because i co-produce opening ceremonies so you have a football field with a stage i get a band to perform at the end of it you know and work out all the sound guys and everything and get all them lined up and this year unfortunately we weren't able to do that so right. for this year i'm kind of in the background just kind of watching 
because I got to figure out this virtual stuff too. <laughs> yeah. So how, I mean, have you guys figured that out? How exactly you're going to do it? Cause I mean, I know you've talked about how people are practicing and exercising and meeting up with their coaches, but have you figured out how it's going to work there about? Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about is the unified or inclusionary piece of what we do. So you know, we, we are one of the foremost inclusionary special Olympics programs in the world. And what I mean by that is that, the great bulk of our athletes, when they compete, uh, do it with non-disabled people. So if you went into the high schools right now, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference. It runs all high school competitions across the state. We've yeah. got five staff embedded into that um, organization who do, uh, with the exception of the summers, uh, different sports. All those sports that are run have athletes with and without disabilities on the same teams. And there's 1.8 million people doing unified sports around the world right now. And why we do it is because we know that when, you know, in the old days, of course, you think about Special Olympics, you think about athletes just doing things together. We have found that by putting them on the same team with people without disabilities, they actually bond hmm. better and strongly. There's all sorts of research to prove this. And so, therefore, all our non-disabled kids in these schools um, are the ones that ensure that our athletes aren't bullied, are ensure, ensure that an athlete isn't sitting there alone at the lunch table. Um, all those, like, little things you think of when you think of our group, uh, and, and those are real scenarios that happen that these non-disabled kids uh, take care of. And invite, I mean, we, we hear stories of, of people with disabilities from parents who've never been to a birthday party in their life. That's awful. And they get on a unified team, and now they're invited for the first time in their life. Sports, and Eunice Kennedy Shriver, she was smart about it because, you know, she had a, her sister was intellectually disabled, Rosemary. And, you know, her family was pretty, uh, pretty good on the sports side, competitive side. But Rosemary was a pretty good athlete. And Mrs. Shriver used to tell me stories about her and Rosemary sailing together down the Cape, and, uh, and they would win. And then Joe Jr. and Jack, President Kennedy, would lose. And then they would, so they'd go up to the house, and the father would be sitting there on the porch. So how would you all do? Right. <laughs> Rosemary, intellectually disabled, Eunice. Oh, we got, we came in first, Daddy. And Jack, how'd you do? Came in third. <laughs> Father was pretty competitive too. And so um, she figured out when that idea was thrown at her that that would be a way of really changing the way we do business with our athletes. Now, what you wouldn't know is an example, um, the starting center fielder for the Los Angeles Dodgers is a partner Who's been, who was on a unified team for four years in Hebron. So we actually have, I run into people now who did unified sports as a kid and they're now running companies. And it completely changes the way the world will go ahead when you have somebody like that and you've got people going, hey, I've got these people with disabilities. You know, we would like to come in and uh, as a workforce and help you. The old days, somebody would have said, no way, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. but now, if you use this in the way that we're doing it, it changes everybody's mindset. So we, we do a ton of inclusionary, unified activities. We've got two members of our board who are Special Olympics athletes. We train 65 of them how to become leaders. We do training all the time with these athletes. And we're really trying to get our athletes who generally in the old days, their only friends were either paid staff or their family members to have people in their lives that are outside of that sphere. And we're being very successful with that. So that's kind of the, that's the road that we're heading down uh, and moving towards. And the, you know, this scenario that we're in right now is a bit unsettling, but I will tell you going back to what DJ and you had asked, if you look at the Fit Five at Home program, 
it's not just Special Olympics athletes that are in that program. I've got a guy in there that was the number three guy for General Electric who lives in Ireland. He's in the Fit Five group. Wow. And he posts pictures of himself walking around Ireland and, uh, <laughs> and doing fitness stuff in Ireland. We have, you'd be shocked at some of the people that are in, in the Fit Five group. So it's as much for non-disabled people who care as it is for the athletes. And so anything that we do virtual down the road, we will try to be doing a slant where somebody like Nick will be on a team with an athlete and they will do some virtual activity together. Mm. You know, um, and certainly when it comes back to the point where we're doing in-person events, all our softball teams, adult teams, they're all unified. All our soccer teams, they're That's all cool. unified. All our all, I never knew that. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. In, in, in bowling, we have 1,600 bowlers. About 800 of them are unified. Wow. Yeah. So um, that's kind of the way of the world when it comes to Special Olympics now. And we have to, as we start looking at this virtual stuff, we've got to make sure that we don't become a segregated program. Again. Right. Right. So I, I wanted to know, what is the criteria to be involved with Special Olympics? If you, know, if you want to say, I'm an athlete and I want to get involved, I want to compete. What's the criteria? What's the age group? And Well, we, we, have, a, we have a program for three to seven-year-olds called um, – young athletes, and that's physical and occupational therapy. We're in 30 schools of that. Then after that, we have an elementary school program, a middle school program, and a high school program for our interscholastic program, which is a separate, completely unified event. On the traditional community side, you can be eight years old and, um, and older in, in order to be involved, and the primary thing is intellectual disability. However, many of our athletes have uh, cognitive delays or autism, uh, physical disabilities. They might have cerebral palsy as well and other, other scenarios. So if you really do look at the great bulk of our people, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit broad. A lot of people who are physically disabled but are, that are not intellectually disabled, there is a sports program for them. But some of those folks become partners on unified teams. Mm. It's a lot more broad, I would say, now than it used to be because it's impossible to turn away. <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard to turn away people, uh, at the, let's say, at the high school level. You know, you get a, a bunch of folks with, who are clearly intellectually disabled. Then you get somebody with autism, high spectrum, and they want to be on the team. Right. No. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know what I mean? They want to be so, on the team. They can be on yeah. the team. So the big thing, though, what we got to tr do is make sure that the ratio of non-disabled people is the same as because you don't want this to become then a segregated group of people with all disabilities. Right. That would not be what we would want down the road. Um, and also, are you looking for volunteers like Nick? Right now, we're, I'm going to say that right now, I, I'm going to say that we're in a holding pattern. Because okay. If, I were, if we were to unleash the doors and have the multitudes come at us at this point in time, we wouldn't have anything for them to do for a while. So yeah. I'm going to say normally I'd be going, oh, God, yeah, Jenny, thank you so much because we got all these things going on. But I would say for people to, um, if, you're, if you're a big fitness person, I would strongly consider going to our um, our homepage and looking at Fit Five at home. You'll be asked three questions. You may have to be screened, um, but if you go through that and you're a bit into fitness, then we would welcome anybody uh, to be a part of that. In the meantime, I would say let's wait and see what happens in the fall. Okay. okay. And what is your website? So it's www.socT.org. S-O-C-T. Dot org. Yep. Dot org. Okay. Yeah. Or go just Google Special Olympic CT. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> and we'll find and we'll find you guys over there, right? Well, thank yeah. you so much. This was yeah, so yeah, great was today. Amazing. I really enjoyed it. And and when we get things back on track, right? I definitely want to come and attend and help out however I possibly can because I yeah. think this would be just spectacular. I know Michi's on board too. He, Absolutely, um, Michi. When you talked about Special Olympics, so when you got to go, you looked so like happy. No, nah, it was great. It was a great experience, and you know, it was just one of those things where you just don't you don't forget. You know what I yeah. mean? I, I, after all these years, I still remember being there. You know, the whole experience, and it was great. That's, That's awesome. Keep me coming back. Yeah. yeah, that's why Nick's like, I'm in it. <laughs> I ain't leaving. Nick, how long did you say you've been volunteering? About 28 years. Whoa, yeah. that's such a long time. Not that's a lot of different things. I did want to mention one thing that we both talked about unified sports. So I had no family members with disabilities when mm -hmm. I started with Special Olympics. Ten years later, I had a niece who was born with um, autism. Mm. And she is now 21. And it was so cool to be able to go to her high school and junior high school games and watch her participate in unified sports. Yeah, that's so, so great. So it kind of was, for me, it was full circle. It's like, wow, now I'm actually, I have, you know, a family member that's actually participating in this, something that I've been supporting for years. That's right. so great. That's, that's awesome. I've seen wow. both sides of it. Well, thank you so much to Bo Doherty, the president of Special Olympics Connecticut, and Nicholas Feligno, who is a committee member and volunteer for Special Olympics of CT. Keep us updated on what happens, you know, moving forward. Yeah. And for the virtual, for their virtual Special Olympics, do you guys have a date yet or?